work for my PhD and some work for my postdoc um, about um, individual variation in dispersal and the consequences that it has for ecology. Okay, so um, just to kind of orient you to the major themes of my research. So all of my research um, interests connect in some way with dispersal. Um, dispersal is a type of movement like migration. So here in this diagram, you can see two different um, geographic regions. Within each uh, region is embedded these habitat patches. Uh, and a habitat patch is just an area that has conditions that are suitable for the survival and reproduction of a species. Um, so routine movement is movement for activities like uh, mate searching or foraging, typically occurs within a habitat patch. Uh, migration is another class of movement that we're all in, uh, familiar with, and that's round trip movement between geographic regions, often in response to seasonality. Um, and then dispersal then is one way movement between habitat patches and is the only type of movement that produces the potential for gene flow. Um, virtually all organisms disperse, but they vary um, quite greatly with respect to the fraction of their populations that disperse, typical dispersal distances, the life stage at which dispersal occurs. Um, organisms also use different modes of dispersal. Um, so some organisms are passive dispersers like plants or sessile marine organisms that uh, disperse on the power of the wind or, or uh, water currents. Um, other organisms are active dispersers which move uh, across space on their own power. And I focus on um, active dispersal in animals on, in my research, uh, but a lot of the same basic concepts apply to passive dispersal too with some caveats. So, uh, aside from being a major life history event in its, in, in its own right, dispersal um, is important, in my opinion, because it influences a wide variety of ecological and evolutionary patterns and processes. So dispersal is a core concept in meta-populations, meta-communities, meta-ecosystems. Uh, dispersal is central to migration, selection, drift, balance. Uh, dispersal drives disease spread dynamics. Um, and, uh, and of course is central to biological invasions. Um, and so our understanding of dispersal has knockdown effects on our understanding of a wide variety of ecological um, uh, and evolutionary dynamics. Um, because of its importance for a wide uh, variety of fields, there's a rich literature on the impacts of dispersal on, on numerous biological dynamics. Um, and the vast majority of these studies use this classical dispersal concept. So there's this value D or, or sometimes M that um, represents a constant fraction of each population that disperses per unit time, say. Um, and this value is, const is, is uh, generally assumed to be constant across populations. And it's generally assumed that dispersers are a random sample of, um, of their populations. Um, but the, uh, uh, we're, we're accumulating this empirical evidence that tells us that actually dispersal is not random, but it often varies um, across populations in response to variation in environmental conditions. So, you know, typically this can be movement away from a low quality habitat towards high quality habitats. Dispersal um, can also uh, be influenced by um, a large number of phenotypic traits. So this is just one example um, here. Uh, many species of aphids are wing dimorphic, uh, which means that some individuals within a species have wings and some don't have wings or they have short stunted wings. Um, and of course, the winged individuals have a much higher capacity to move between habitat patches than the wingless individuals. Um, there's a, a large, a long list of phenotypic traits that can that influence dispersal that have been shown to influence dispersal. They're not all um, traits that are these kind of binary large effect traits. Some um, things like body size, um, um, the size of energy reserves, even personality can have um, more continuous um, and smaller effects on dispersal. Um, so since dispersal is conditional on the phenotype and the environment, 
the obvious question then is, then, well, how does this impact ecological and evolutionary processes? So, so typically when we think about dispersal with, um, in the context of, other, of these other things, we, we, we're thinking of this classical dispersal concept. Um, so you know, these arrows, I've, I've, I've drawn these diagrams with a classic dispersal concept in mind. These arrows are symmetrical. We don't have multiple arrows for different phenotypes or things like this. But increasingly, we know that, that this, this classic dispersal concept is outdated. And we really need to be thinking to be rethinking the role of dispersal in biological dynamics. Um, research on the consequences of dispersal uh, that's conditional on the environment and the phenotype is still scarce, really. But there's a small number of really compelling examples. Um, so one that might be familiar to a lot of you is uh, this, uh, the invasion of cane toads through Australia. And there have been a lot of great studies on this invasion, um, showing that as the in invasion progresses, um, the toads that are at the forefront of the invasion are the ones that tend to be the most dispersive. Uh, and, and one way that uh, um, one way in which they're they're dispersive is that they have long legs, and so they can physically move uh, further distances than their shorter legged counterparts. Um, and this a uh, combination of, of dis, uh, this, this accumulation of dispersive traits at the invasion front has, um, uh, uh, has had the consequence that the invasion speed has actually accelerated through time. So this is the increase in the range. And you can see that the, the range, uh, the, the increase in the range is, is getting bigger um, every time period. Another example is, um, uh, this example from Cote et al, where they did a, this experiment with mosquito fish, and they first assayed the fish to separate them into kind of uh, highly dispersive and non-dispersive fish. And then they put these two groups of fish into tanks of uh, uh, water with a community of their invertebrate prey. Um, and the dispersers tended to be larger and more aggressive. What they found was that the dispersers had a larger imp impact on their invertebrate prey. So they, the density of, of invertebrates was, was lower after 28 days than um, when compared to the, the invertebrate communities in, uh, in tanks with non-dispersive fish. So this is telling us that, that dispersive uh, phenotypes have impacts on their communities uh, compared to non-dispersive phenotypes. <clears throat> okay, so here is a representation of what I've been, been talking about, that the biotic environment together with the abiotic environment, which is important as well, um, uh, influences the number and the phenotypes of dispersers. And then that in turn can feed back to influence the biotic environment. Um, but there are major gaps in our understanding of this process. So. And kind of broadly, we, we don't have a complete understanding of what aspects of the biotic and abiotic environment influence dispersal and how organisms integrate information about multiple variables to make dispersal decisions. Um, and even more uh, kind of black box is um, uh, how do the consequences of conditional dispersal differ from our current expectations based on the idea our classic idea that dispersal is constant, independent of environment, independent of the phenotype. Um, and so these are the questions that drive my research program. Um, okay, so I'm gonna tell you about two different uh, uh, themes uh, that both relate to uh, 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 this feedback between the biotic environment and dispersal. So the first, I'm gonna tell you about a couple projects on the theme of parasite dependent host dispersal. And then I'm gonna um, talk to you about, um, about uh, individual uh, variation in dispersal and how it impacts population spread through a fragmented habitat. So first, um, how do parasites influence host dispersal and how does this feed back to the biotic environment? Um, the importance of dispersal to host parasite dynamics um, has been recognized for a long time now. This is an example of a model developed by George Hess um, a few decades ago now, um, where he um, uh, varied the what he called the immigration rate. Here's this uh, M popping up 
um, basically similar to the dispersal or dispersal rate that I've been talking about. So the fraction of a population that disperses per unit time. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have the proportion of patches that are, are occupied by either infected or what we call susceptible or, or uninfected individuals. Um, so when we have a low dispersal rate, the host metapopulation goes extinct, uh, which is a classic result. As we increase the dispersal rate further, the host uh, population persists. So there's uh, susceptible or uninfected host individuals present, but the disease can't persist. As we increase dispersal further, we get this, um, uh, this into this zone of endemic disease where we have some infected and some infect, uh, susceptible individuals. And when you increase, when you crank dispersal rate right up, we end into this zone of pandemic disease. Um, and this same results that increasing host dispersal increases the prevalence of parasites and increases the probability of endemic and pandemic disease has been observed in a couple of theoretical models and in a couple of great experimental studies in which the researchers um, manipulated the dispersal rate. Um, but as someone who studies dispersal itself, studies dispersal behavior, I see this glaring gap in, in these studies great studies, I'm not knocking them, I'm just bringing this different perspective that these studies um, tend to assume that that dispersal is a constant rate. And of course, we know that dispersal is not a constant rate. Um, that uh, And th so these studies don't consider how parasites themselves might be influencing dispersal in their hosts. Um, and so that's what I wanted to contribute. Um, so we know that parasites can interfere with the host dispersal uh, ability. Um, so this is just an example I love. I love this photo. These are mites um, that are attached to the wings of this dragonfly. Um, and we can, we, we uh, just intuitively expect that this is going to impact the flight of this dragonfly. Um, so the, the mites can interfere with the aerodynamics of flight. They can damage the fragile wing tissue. Um, they're also draining um, hemolymph, so potentially draining energy from the dragonfly. Um, we also might intuitively expect that hosts will have an incentive to disperse when they sense that they're at risk of parasitism, even if they're not themselves infected. If they can, if they can uh, detect parasites in their environment, they might be uh, motivated to disperse away. And so I wanted to know how these multiple effects of parasites interacted to influence host dispersal. Um, and I tested this using the back swimmer Nodonecta undulata. Back swimmers are um, semi-aquatic uh, true bugs. So they, um, they live in the aquatic environment, they live in, in uh, the water, but they breathe air. This species lives, uh, tends to live in small fishless ponds. Um, they, this species is, uh, uh, they're facultative dispersers, so they can live their entire life cycle in the same pond, um, but the adults have wings and they are capable of, of dispersing by flight between ponds. Uh, this is just a great photo. Back swimmers um, tend to be really clunky flyers. They're not graceful uh, like you, you know, it, you, when you see other insects flying, like flies or bees, they are, you know, maneuverable. Um, back swimmers are not that. They can fly in one direction and they kind of drag their legs behind them. Okay, so uh, back swimmers are commonly infected with these hydrachnidia freshwater mites. Um, this arrow is it's pointing towards, it's, this isn't a great photo, but this uh, it's arrows pointing towards this red mite that has attached under the hemolytrin or the wing casing of the, of the back swimmer. Um, and that is the typical attachment site for mites on back swimmers. And on the right here, you can see a blown up photo of the mite. Um, so mites are parasitic in their larval form. The larval, the larva um, uh, swim around in the water searching for a host. They generally attach to the host when the host is undergoing its final molt, when their integument is, is vulnerable. Um, they uh, dig their mouth parts into the host and glue themselves in. And then they, um, they, they stay there engorging themselves on the hemolymph of the host for days to weeks um, until they're fully engorged. So this photo is a fully engorged mite. You can see it's really like swollen. Um, once they're fully engorged, they fall off 
um, and they undergo, meta undergo metamorphosis, um, and the adults mites are free swimming and predaceous. Mites themselves are not able to disperse, they hitch a ride on their hosts. So uh, we wanted to know how these mite parasites influence uh, dispersal of the Baxamers. And like I, I touched on, there are two different mechanisms by which this is possible. So parasites can influence the motivation of their host to disperse. Um, by definition, of course, parasites reduce host fitness. This is an example of a, of a different Baxamer species that also gets infected with these freshwater mites. Um, and here, this study um, demonstrated that um, the fecundity of healthy Baxamers is much higher than the fecundity of infected Baxamers. Um, so because parasites reduce host fitness, we expect that hosts will have an incentive to disperse when they sense that they're at risk of gaining a, a parasit, uh, parasitic infection. Um, so we can predict, uh, here we have dispersal probability on the y-axis, we predict that, back, uh, that hosts in general, if they perceive themselves to be at risk of parasitic infection, will have higher dispersal than ho hosts that um, do not perceive themselves to be at risk. Um, I tested that um, using a mesocosm experiment in the field. So mesocosms are just big tanks that we fill with water. Um, and in these tanks, I manipulated um, the, the um, uh, uh, perception of mite, oh, sorry, the, I, I manipulated the presence of, of parasite cues in two different ways. So in half the tanks, I filled them with water that had come from ponds that contained uh, mites. So they had chemical cues of mites in the water and I filtered the water. Um, uh, to keep out big things and let the chemical cues remain. And then half the tanks were filled with water that had come from ponds that did not contain parasites. I crossed that treatment with a treatment um, uh, which manipulated the presence of a, of a, uh, a conspecific and whether it was infected. So each tank got a cage. In half the cages, I put a Baxamer that was infected with mites. And in the other half of the cages, um, the Baxamer was not infected with mites. And so the, um, the, the experimental Baxamers could uh, potentially perceive whether they were in a, a tank with an infected conspecific. Each tank got 16 healthy Baxamers, so they were not infected. I wanted to get at um, the changes in dispersal behavior um, that were caused by a perception of, of a risk of parasitism. I didn't want to confound that with actual infection. Okay, so we left them out in the uh, in the field, and then we counted how many Baxamers dispersed over the course of a week. Um, so they're actually flying out of their tanks. So here are the results of that experiment. On the Y, we have the proportion of the Baxamers that dispersed. On the X, we have the water treatment. So um, the water either did not contain parasite cues or contained those chemical cues of parasites. Um, and then the gray bars are uh, tanks that had uh, uh, the caged Baxamer was not infected. And then the red bars, the caged Baxamer was infected. Um, so you can see, um, Baxamers that were exposed to parasite cues in the water were, uh, were more likely to disperse than Baxamers that um, were not exposed to parasite cues, but the, um, the infection status of the caged Baxamer didn't have an additional effect. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so we found that parasites increase or the, the risk of parasitism increases dispersal motivation in the host. Um, but parasites also have this, this other potential impact. They might influence uh, a phenotype in ways that might affect dispersal. So parasites could influence body condition, morphology, body shape, um, the condition of dispersal structures in ways that might influence the ability of their host to disperse. <clears throat> uh, so our prediction is that while Baxamers that are not infected but perceive themselves to be at risk of an infection will have higher dispersal, um, hosts that are actually infected will have lower dispersal ability, and so their, dis their dispersal will actually be constrained. We tested this um, by conducting an assay um, uh, on, on Baxamers. We uh, collected Baxamers that were either not infected or had light, moderate, or heavy infections, and we placed them in cups with a small amount of water. 
Um, and pilot experiments had told us that back swimmers do not like being in these cups. Uh, about 75% of healthy back swimmers will disperse in about 20 minutes of being in the, in the cups. Um, and so this is really an assay of the back swimmer's ability to fly. Uh, so here are the results of that assay. Again, we have the proportion of back swimmers that dispersed on the y-axis as a function of their mite load or mite infest infestation score. Um, and we can see that we replicated the results of our pilot experiment. So um, in this case, about 70% of healthy back swimmers just burst out of the cups. But as you increase mite load, you decrease um, uh, the, the probability that the back swimmers flew away. So you can see we had 15 back swimmers with heavy mite loads. None of those were able to fly out of the cups. Um, and this came as no surprise to us. So as I told you, the, the mites attach under the hemolytra or the wing casings of the, sorry, I'm touching my back, where the, the mites usually attach. Um, the, so the mites can interfere with the wings directly. They also, they, as they become engorged, they push the hemolytra away from the body, the body and expose the fragile wings. And so what we often see is that back swimmers with heavy mite infections will have um, rips or uh, in their wings or their wings will even be torn all the way off. Um, so we find that parasites um, uh, have these two opposing effects on their hosts. The risk of parasitism can increase dispersal motivation, but parasite infection uh, in this case can strongly reduce dispersal ability. <clears throat> okay, so Next, I'm going to tell you about the arrow in the other direction that uh, host dispersal has the potential to influence the biotic environment. In this case, we're interested in parasite abundance. Um, and to test this question, uh, we uh, developed a model. So we is um, myself in collaboration with Allison Shaw, who's faculty at the University of Minnesota. Um, and we developed a, a stochastic metapopulation model where we had 50 patches in a landscape um, each with uh, uh, 20 individuals. Um, and then we uh, randomly introduced infection into one individual in the population at random. Um, so uh, hosts could either be infected in red or uninfected um, in black. If they're uninfected, then they're susceptible to the, uh, to the infection. Um, <clears throat> hosts that are infected never recover. Transmission of parasites occurs locally within a patch, um, and uh, transmission occurs directly by contact between an infected and uh, an uninfected or susceptible individual. Um, and infected individuals have elevated mortality. The in infection can spread to new patches when an infected host disperses. Uh, dispersal is assumed to be global, so each individual has an equal chance of moving to any other patch in the population or in the landscape. Um, and dispersal is associated with mortality risk. Okay. Um, and what um, sets our model apart is that we input into the model different strategies um, for the host, different dispersal strategies that can respond to both context or local parasite prevalence and infection state. Um, so we uh, this is the, we input into the model, um, uh, an individual's dispersal probability depends on um, local parasite prevalence. So we assume that individuals have information about how prevalent uh, the parasite is in their local patch, and they make dispersal decisions based on that. Um, we also assume that they know their own infection state, so whether they're infected or not. Um, and we input into the model all different combinations. So I spared you a slide with like eight different figures showing all the different combinations, but we can have uh, dispersal probability be an increasing function of uh, local parasite prevalence, decreasing function. Uh, we have we can have infected individuals being uh, having higher dispersal, susceptible individuals having higher dispersal. Um, or uh, susceptible and infected individuals having the same level of dispersal. 
Okay, and then uh, we input those different dispersal strategies into the model, and then we run each simulation until the infection disappears from the population or until regional infection prevalence um, uh, reaches a steady state or no longer changes systematically. And then at the end, we calculate regional parasite prevalence, which is the proportion of this entire host metapopulation that is infected with the parasite. So I'm going to show you um, our results for regional parasite prevalence as a fraction uh, as a function of the fraction of the host population that disperses. Um, <clears throat> and this is so we can kind of separate um, the dispersal rate from the dispersal strategy. Okay, so first I'm showing you the results for um, our unconditional, our null model, our unconditional dispersal. So we input into the model that dispersal is a constant. Uh, this is the classic dispersal model. Dispersal is a constant, it's independent of infection state, it's independent of uh, local parasitism risk. And we predict that regional parasite prevalence should be should increase with the fraction dispersing uh, because more dispersal means that the um, infection is spread to more patches, the parasite can reach um, um, uh, populations of, of hosts that have been underexploited by the parasite. Um, but what we actually find is this uh, hump-shaped relationship. So it, this relationship is positive uh, when there's um, when the fraction dispersing is low. But when you get to moderate and high um, uh, values of the fraction dispersing, um, what you get is that because there is a mortality risk associated with dispersal, um, uh, this becomes dispersal becomes a, a pretty significant source of mortality for the parasite. So every time an infected individual attempts dispersal and dies during dispersal, that parasite also dies and it removes the opportunity for the parasite to be spread to other individuals in the population. Uh, Okay, so now when we look at state and context dependent dispersal, so these are results for when um, uh, dispersal probability is a positive or increasing function of local parasite prevalence. Um, and I'm showing um, in the results both when uh, dispersal is uh, S biased, so susceptible individuals disperse more, and when dispersal is I biased, so infected disperse. Uh, infected individuals disperse more, um, or when it's unbiased. So susceptible and infected individuals have the same dispersal probability. Um, so you can see this uh, pattern kind of uh, mirrors um, the pattern of the unconditional dispersal, except uh, when, I, when it's I biased, we see um, um, rather than a hump shaped, a pretty negative relationship. Um, surprisingly, we saw that uh, S bias dispersal often has higher results in higher regional parasite prevalence than the I bias dispersal. Um, and that is again because if um, infected individuals do a lot of the dispersing, um, they are exposing the parasite to more morta mortality. Um, and S bias dispersal can actually pretty effectively mix infected and, and susceptible in individuals. Uh, because some infected individuals do still disperse and some susceptible individuals uh, will disperse into patches that have um, high uh, parasite prevalence. Okay, and then on this next slide, I'm showing you results for when dispersal probability is a decreasing function of local parasite prevalence. So this um, is uh, expected to be less common in nature than a positive, um, than, than positive context dependence. But it, it, um, uh, there are a small number of examples of it occurring in nature, and it might be expected if parasites um, uh, tend to be clustered in large populations or populations with, um, uh, or sorry, if hosts um, uh, tend to move towards population, uh, towards habitat patches that are high um, habitat quality, but that also have large populations with a lot of parasites. Um, and you can see that our results is, is uh, flipped here. So instead of a hump-shaped relationship, we have a kind of U-shaped relationship. Um, and now in the I-biased um, 
uh, stimulation has higher regional prevalence. So there's, I'm throwing a lot of, of data at you, but um, um, the gist is that uh, regional parasite prevalence depends on both state and context dependent dispersal. Uh, and that unintuitive patterns emerge when we consider how the host responds behaviorally to the parasite. Um, we expect to see positive relationships between dispersal rate and regional parasite prevalence. That's not always what we see. It depends on the specifics of the system. So um, how the, the, the host responds behaviorally to the parasite. Importantly, I, uh, I showed the, uh, the strong effect of dispersal mortality. Um, and I haven't shown you, but we have results showing that other characteristics of the host parasite system, um, so virulence rate and transmission, sorry, virulence and transmission rate also influence this relationship. Um, and so uh, the takeaway is that we expect to see a lot of variation in this relationship um, that will uh, vary across uh, host parasite systems, depending on a lot of different factors. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears away from parasites and talk to you about um, uh, uh, population spread through fragmented habitat. So we have an urgent need to understand and predict the spread of populations um, in order to manage uh, things like uh, climate, -driven, climate driven rain shifts, the spread of emerging diseases, um, biological invasions, um, and population spread in these contexts is occurring um, in the context of substantial and ongoing habitat fragmentation. And so understanding population spread in continuous habitats isn't enough. We have to understand the dynamics of spread in, in patchy and fragmented habitats. Um, and spatial networks where habitat patches are represented by nodes and corridors or, or movement uh, links movement paths are represented by links between habitat nodes. These are powerful representations of um, patchy and fragmented habitats. So coming back to our goal of understanding population spread uh, to better, to allow us to better manage species and maintain biodiversity. Um, and this is commonly achieved by preserving or, or sometimes enlarging habitats. Another way to do this is to improve the quality of the habitat fragments that remain. So for example, through pollution remediation. Um, but another method that is becoming increasingly popular is to manipulate corridors between populations to increase um, population connectivity. Um, so more and more, we are creating natural or, or green corridors to support dispersal. Um, of course, we've also been doing the opposite for a long time. We, for a long time, we've been uh, erecting barriers to restrict the spread of invasive species and diseases, in essence, destroying a connecting corridor. So we're pretty invested in um, managing populations through manipulation of habitat configuration or the, the, the configuration of links between habitat patches. Um, and so this pressing question has emerged how do we design corridors to support our conservation goals? And the objective of this project was to answer uh, this fundamental question of um, whether the configuration of links between habitat patches influences population spread. Um, in, in designing this project, we wanted to know how organisms respond behaviorally to different habitat configurations. So in a natural environment, the habitat patches are more or less geographically embedded, right? Habitat doesn't move around a lot. And so um, changing the configuration of links necessarily changes the length of those links. Um, and so we thought it was important to consider how organisms respond to changes uh, or to respond to differences in link lengths and whether this response varies across species. Um, okay, so um, there are many factors that shape a species dispersal kernel. A, a dispersal kernel is simply the probability of the distribution function, um, uh, showing dispersal probability as a function of, of distance. Um, <clears throat> so this is just showing, uh, uh, this is showing different potential uh, dispersal kernels. Um, dispersal kernels can vary widely across species. 
Um, so aspects of dispersible ability, such as movement capacity, uh, or the ability to withstand inhospitable conditions in the matrix can, um, uh, can influence how dispersal success declines with distance. So here, dispersal probability is declining with distance. Um, and uh, control the link lengths that can be successfully uh, traversed by a species. Um, there are also aspects of dispersal propensity um, that can influence the shape of the dispersal kernel. So things like um, how willing a species is to disperse, even if they have the capacity, um, um, how much species assess link properties like distance before they embark on dispersal, um, how likely they are to alter their behavior once they've dis begun the dispersal process, so how likely they are to do things like reverse their path. Um, and so dispersal kernels vary widely across species. Um, and we um, uh, use this concept of a dispersal kernel to understand how species respond to different link lengths. And we expected that the shape of a species dispersal kernel would interact with habitat configuration to determine the rate of spread um, of a population. Okay. So we had multiple objectives for this project. We wanted to determine how uh, habitat configuration influences the rate of population spread. Uh, we wanted to know um, whether information about distance dependent dispersal or that dispersal kernel is necessary to predict spread or whether we can just use information about the habitat configuration. Um, importantly for, for uh, applications to, to uh, biodiversity conservation, we wanted to identify into indicators that link information about species specific dispersal behavior and habitat structure or configuration to predict spread rates um, to make it easy for habitat managers to, um, to use the information that we're providing about habitat configuration uh, and leverage information about dispersal to maximize connectivity and preserve biodiversity. Okay, so to um, meet the obje these objectives, uh, we uh, conducted a uh, study using springtails as a model system. Springtails are ubiquitous across the globe. They are ecologically important. So they, they eat uh, fungus in the soil um, and do things like affect the rates of soil decomposition and the cycling of nutrients. Um, they are an ideal model for our purposes because they are small and they disperse at small spatial scales. So they disperse by walking um, and landscapes at the scale of just tens of centimeters are biologically realistic for the scope of dispersal for, for these organisms, which I didn't mention they're about a millimeter uh, long. Um, and we can easily house springtails in the lab. Um, and because the, the full landscapes um, can be just a few, a few tens of centimeters um, across, we can actually replicate at the entire landscape level. We paired a model and an experiment. So we used published records about age dependent survival and fecundity. Uh, and we put that into the model. Um, and we um, measured in the lab the dispersal kernel of Fulsomia. <clears throat> uh, so this, this dark uh, black, the thick black line is showing the dispersal kernel of Fulsomia uh, with and the gray bands as show the 95% confidence intervals. We paired the model with an experiment in the lab um, uh, where we, um, we placed uh, uh, real Fulsomia in networks and observed this spread through a network. So we designed habitat networks of three different configurations. We have lattice networks where each habitat patch or node is connected to its four nearest neighbors. Uh, we had random configurations where uh, we designed these by taking the lattice networks and then we um, what we call rewired the networks. So each link uh, we moved it to connect two different habitat nodes. And we did that with all of the links to completely randomize the link configuration. Um, and then we had an intermediate configuration, partially rewired or partially random, where 20% of the links were rewired. So this is what they look like conceptually. This is what they look like in the lab, in the experiment. Um, and we used exactly the same link configurations in both the experiment and the model. So we compare exactly the experimental um, 
system with the model system. Um, in the experiment, we had eight replicates of each of these, um, these uh, uh, habitat configurations. And then in both the model and the experiment, we placed 10 individuals in a single node in the network. And then we observed as the springtail populations spread across the network. So here I'm showing a node population size for representative replicates of lattice, partially rewired, and random configurations. Each of these lines shows a separate node uh, and the population size in a separate node. Um, and so we were observing. Um, at which point each node became colonized. Um, our spread metric was time to full network occupancy. Um, so this is just a conceptualization of that. So we start with springtails in a single uh, node, and then we observe as um, the springtails spread through the network. And when every node in the network has at least one springtail, we record that day as the time at which that network became fully occupied. Okay, so coming back to our objectives, our first was to determine how config habitat configuration influences the rate of population spread. Um, so here I'm showing you the results for both the model and on the left and the experiment on the right. Uh, we have our sped, spread metric days to full network occupancy on the y axis for lattice partially random and random uh, configurations. And you can see in both the model and the experiment. Uh, spread occurs fastest in the lattice networks and slowest in the random networks. <clears throat> okay, so that met our first objective. We know uh, that uh, that habitat configuration has a strong impact on uh, population spread. Our next objective was to determine whether we need information about the dispersal kernel um, to predict spread. And I'm not gonna show you these results, but basically we ran a different version of the model where we didn't include um, information about the dis dispersal kernel. We just assumed that all links were equal, the springtails used all links equally. Um, and that version of the model did a much worse job at predicting uh, spread rate in the experiment. Okay, so we had this conservation, uh, this objective geared towards conservation. We wanted to identify indicators that link information about dispersal behavior to uh, and the and information about habitat, spatial structure, configuration to predict spread rate. Um, so we investigated a couple and we settled on algebraic connectivity. Um, which is um, a connectivity metric. Um, it can incorporate information about both the configuration or which habitat nodes are connected and the lengths of those nodes. Um, for the technical minded among you, uh, the, the technical definition is uh, of algebraic connectivity is the, the second smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian matrix of G. So it's one of the uh, metrics that come out of the Laplacian matrix. Um, from previous work, uh, algebraic connectivity is known to predict dynamic processes in, in networks. And so it was a good candidate to, um, uh, to test to see whether it influenced spread dynamics in our metrics. The other thing that made it a good candidate metric is that algebraic connectivity is easy to calculate and we don't need to um, uh, figure out some hypothetical proportion of rewired links in order uh, of, a, of a natural landscape. It's easy to calculate algebraic connectivity for natural landscapes. OK, so here we have, again, our spread metric days to full network occupancy on the Y and algebraic connectivity on the, on the X for both the model and the experiment. And algebraic connectivity uh, uh, predicts a lot of variation in spread, to, in spread rate. A full third of the uh, variation in spread rate in the experiment can be explained by algebraic connectivity. Um, and that is really exciting to me because it um, means that algebraic connectivity can potentially be used to predict um, the spread rate of, uh, of populations in real world ecological networks, uh, potentially even before it uh, the spread happens. So for example, in the context of biological invasions, if we have information about the dispersal uh, kernel of the species. <clears throat> 
Um, our next objective was to determine whether species vary in their response to habitat configuration. So here I showed you this thick black line was the dispersal kernel for Folsomia Canada. Um, we extended the model to explore different dispersal kernel shapes. So we have dispersal kernel where uh, kernels were dispersed long distance dispersal is much more common um, and dispersal kernels where long distance dispersal is much more rare. Um, and so this is just an extension of the model. Of course, we can't change the natural dispersal of Folsomia, so we couldn't pair that with the experiment. But our model results um, uh, suggest that uh, the shape of the dispersal kernel um, interacts strongly with habitat configuration. So this black line here um, is showing the uh, dispersal, the exponent of the dispersal kernel for, um, for our springtails. And uh, as I showed you before, lattice networks spread occurs fastest in lattice networks and slowest in random networks. But in a species where with which had have um, uh, much more common long distance dispersal, the order of configurations actually completely flips. So spread occurs fastest in random and slowest in the lattice configurations. Uh, so to summarize, algebraic connectivity is a strong predictor of spread rate. And uh, importantly, the effects of habitat configuration are not universal. The configuration that promotes the fastest spread depends on dispersal traits, which potentially um, has implications, has practical implications. So if we can speed up or slow down uh, population spread by altering the configuration of, of landscape, we could potentially promote the spread of native species and hinder the spread of invasive species, as long as those species had different dispersal kernels. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, I hope I've, I've convinced you that, um, that the biotic environment influences the number and phenotypes of dispersal dispersers and that this can feed back to influence the biotic environment um, and that we um, have to start considering individual variation in dispersal and conditional dispersal um, in a, a wide number of fields in biology in order to understand uh, the dynamics of um, ecological and evolutionary systems. Um, I just want to thank the people who, thank, who helped me in the field um, at the Koffler Scientific Reserve and funding, and I will take any questions.